talks tougher on efforts to treat Ebola at home. But apologies and recriminations emerge over the treatment and handling of Ebola victims. The Pistorius hearing goes on, but when will he actually learn of his sentence? I'm Karen Giannone outside the court in Pretoria where it seems the decision on his sentence could still be weeks away. And they're singing the blues from pretty early in Mississippi. We're taking a look at some of the big questions there for the US midterm elections. Also in the programme, more turmoil, Alice, for the global markets. Absolutely right, David. It's been something of a roller coaster, hasn't it? Uh, Europe uh, shares have uh, dropped uh, on the lowest inflation figures that we've seen in five years. Asia also closes down 2%, and the US is bracing itself for further downward spiralling. But is this a stock market shock or a much needed readjustment? It's midday here in London, 7 a.m. in Washington, 6 a.m. in Dallas, where a senior health official has now apologised for mistakes made in the handling of Thomas Duncan, the Liberian man who died of Ebola in the city. His treatment drew criticism from nursing staff, as has the permission to fly given to a nurse who's since been diagnosed with Ebola. Well, the World Health Organization does say it's confident that a major outbreak is unlikely in North America or Western Europe because the health systems there are pretty strong. But the disease has killed around 4,500 people so far, most of those in West Africa. President Obama has ordered a more aggressive response to Ebola in the United States. From Dallas, Alistair Lethet has this report. America's latest Ebola patient being taken from Dallas to a specialized unit in Atlanta. Amber Vinson, like the other nurse who was infected with the virus, had been caring for Thomas Eric Duncan, the Liberian who developed symptoms after arriving in Texas. Protective measures were apparently not properly taken. She was infected and developed symptoms of the virus. President Obama cancelled a trip to deal with the increasing concern over the way the Texas Health Presbyterian Hospital has been dealing with the virus. If we do these protocols properly, if we follow the steps, if we get the information out, then the likelihood of widespread uh, Ebola outbreaks in this country are very, very low. This is not a hospital that specializes in contagious diseases like Ebola, but so far its record on the outbreak has not been good. First, a misdiagnosis left Mr. Duncan contagious and in the community for four days. Then a breach in protocol led to two nurses being infected, dozens more now under observation. And what's more, a nurse who was under quarantine was able to travel on a commercial flight. It doesn't inspire confidence in the promise that everything will be done to prevent the spread of Ebola. The nurse was in self-monitoring quarantine, but flew to Ohio to visit family. She flew back the day before being diagnosed with Ebola, and doctors are trying to trace 132 passengers on her flight for monitoring. The risk of transmission is said to be low. We spoke to um, her family members, and we're looking at getting information. Now, the thing is, is that we're looking at being able to construct a good timeline of where the health care worker was when she was here and where she traveled and who she was with. And that takes a little bit of time. She arrived in Atlanta and was taken to the Emory Hospital, one of four in America, which is a specialized unit to deal with highly infectious diseases. A fast response team has now been set up for future Ebola cases to ensure the procedures are followed to the letter, to prevent medical workers from being infected, and to restore confidence in America's ability to control what began as one single Ebola case. Well, that's Alistair Leithed there. With me now is our health reporter, James Gallagher. James, let's just draw on the case of the, a nurse getting on a flight. I mean, a nurse who's been treating an Ebola patient seems a bit extraordinary to some of us anyway, but how could she pass on Ebola. Now that they're looking at all the other passengers on board, what should they be worried about? We know about sneezing. We got, we got that, but is that it? Well, we have to remember is that when it comes to transmitting Ebola, you're really talking about three major ways of transmission, and that's through blood, 
through vomit and through feces. Those are your major, major sources. Now, if she was displaying fever the day after the flight, she's unlikely to have had any problem with any of those other sources of infection. So the risk to the other passengers is going to be incredibly, incredibly small. But uh, she could have used the toilet, for example, and there would be a potential, given that we know she had a temperature then, that there, there may be some risk that for, for passengers to have to think about whether they were uh, in, in contact with any of those areas. Well, this is the thing. If she had, if she was vomiting and she did have diarrhoea, then those and those bodily fluids could be contaminated and then she could contaminate other surfaces. However, it doesn't appear as if she did have those symptoms, so those surfaces should not be contaminated and there shouldn't actually be a risk to passengers. So that's the theory anyway. Right, and there, yeah, you're right, there's no suggestion she was that ill. Mm. Nonetheless, she had a temperature and she pointed it out. That counts as a symptom, doesn't mm. it? And um, it, it opens up this whole question of where, almost where symptoms start and why is it that if you're not showing a symptom two hours earlier you're deemed not to be capable of passing it on and then suddenly hey presto you can pass it on. It's a very grey area isn't but it? But exactly the U US Centers of Disease Control says that one of your first symptoms is fever so that has a very specific temperature threshold so it's about 38.6 degrees Celsius and that's what 105 and a half Fahrenheit so that's the threshold at which they say you have fever but what, what if you're half a degree below that and you're obviously on a transition up to it. There is going to be a fuzzy area and different people will be in a slightly different position however but the big broad thing to remember is that it's the big three again, vomiting, diarrhea and direct contact with blood. Those are the big sources of transmission. If you have those symptoms, you're, you're going to be able to transmit the disease. If you don't, then it's even more unlikely, even if you are just a few hours before you officially hit an official symptom. James, thanks very much indeed for the, uh, the clarification there. Well, the whole race to find an effective vaccine for Ebola, of course, goes on, and goes on apace, actually. Joining me now via webcam is Professor Mike Levine, who is with the Centre for Vaccine Development at the University of Maryland School of Medicine. Professor, thanks very much indeed for joining us. Um, I know you're involved with the trials now taking place in Mali. Do you get a sense that this, this whole... Um, effort is going on at an extraordinary pace? Oh, without question, we have been moving at warp speed to bring the vaccine that we're working with, which is a vaccine created at the Vaccine Research Center of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases in Bethesda, to bring that from the point where it was in August having only been tested in monkeys, to where it could be administered to healthcare workers in Mali participating in a phase one trial, to do that in 60 days is simply extraordinary and is the consequence of many different partners in a consortium uh, led by the World Health Organization with every partner pitching in, doing everything possible to uh, get things done in the quickest possible manner. I mean, it's been some 40 years that we've known about Ebola. I know you've been working on vaccines for a good 40 years now. Does it surprise you that it's, ta A, taken this long to get here, uh, and B, that, uh, that now suddenly there is a drive, it can be done? Well, I, I think you, you make two different points in, in your comments. First is that prior to the West Africa outbreak, Ebola was a relatively rare and exotic uh, tropical disease that had a very high case fatality, but uh, almost always uh, took place in many outbreaks in very rural areas in Central or in uh, East Central Africa, and collectively was uh, you know, just a, a few, some hundreds of cases in total over four decades. What's happening in West Africa with Ebola is writing a new chapter. It's just totally, totally new to us. And we're seeing a worst case, uh, previously, I think, largely unimagined uh, ep epidemiologic picture. Right. So, so is the reality also then that for the likes of um, GlaxoSmithKline, for example, involved in, in these trials, that it simply wasn't a, a, a profitable proposition to try and work out a vaccine? Yes, before this outbreak, the 
target population and the market, if you will, was extremely, extremely limited. It was largely what we call in the U.S. a biodefense vaccine for a highly lethal uh, disease that was a problem in theory if uh, nefarious individuals would uh, deliberately cause a release of this. This is something we very much worried about in the decade after the events of uh, uh, September 11, 2001, and the anthrax uh, episode that, that followed thereafter. It, scientists who work in the laboratory with Ebola were one target population. Small numbers of healthcare workers uh, who would be a, a SWAT team, the Médecins Sans Frontières type individuals who previously brought the and World Health Organization individuals who brought the previous mini epidemics under control, they were another target population. Right. But so, mass uh, immunization and large number of individuals, that was not really on, on the docket. If there are very few numbers in the target population, that means a small market other than a government stockpiling vaccine in the theoretical event of a nefarious uh, uh, deliberate release. Well, it West seems Africa. clear we're in a, in a very different scenario now, aren't we? Uh, Professor Levine, we're going to have to stop there, but thanks very much indeed for uh, bringing your expertise to bear uh, here on GMT. Well, if you want more on the situation in Ebola, as we're seeing day by day, it's changing, isn't it? Make sure you uh, catch BBC World News at 18.30 GMT. In fact, every day this week, we're bringing you a special programme at 18.30 GMT with the very latest on the outbreak, uh, and it's all here on BBC World News. Let's catch up on uh, some other stories for you now. A commander of the Kurdish militia defending the Syrian town of Kobani says that Islamic State fighters have been driven out of all the areas of the town except for two pockets of resistance on the eastern fringes. Bahrain Kandal, who commands Kurdish fighters in the east of what is a mainly Kurdish town, told the BBC US-led airstrikes had